everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. What up, Rob? It's Jackie. And hi, it's me, Diana. Hello, hello. So you guys all watch the big game? I always watch the big game. The big game of health sports. The health sports game. Yeah, I watch that one too. Go team. I like when they have the ball. Sometimes they do scorpion kicks. It's just all sorts of, all sorts of great. Sometimes they do the Cincinnati step. Yeah, or the yeah. or the or the Super Bowl <laughs> shuffle. Exactly. Just... And they have sticks. Oh yeah, you gotta have sticks or both. Yep. I have a confession to make, everybody. I can't wait. Oh, what is it? I don't know that much about sports. Sports game. Which, on the one hand. Pro, this is a podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, where every week we discuss a topic related to the field. So lucky for us, we don't usually talk about sports, but unlucky, I don't know anything about sports. So for us to do a whole episode talking about supervision, supervision, we're good, but supervision in health, sports and fitness. Oh, no, I don't even know where to start. We're not even using the terms right. I was faking it. Could you tell? I thought I was doing a good job. It was very convincing. All right, you believe me, yeah, but our listeners might not. Oh, okay. So fortunately for us to talk about our, our topic this week, we have a returning special guest, Dr. Mallory Quinn. Mallory, welcome back to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. It has been it has been it has been quite some time. And we're so excited to have you back to talk about supervision, specifically related to your area of expertise, health sports and fitness. Yes, is, and I hate to burst your bubble, but I don't know much about the game with sticks either. But um. you know what? That's okay. So this episode's about supervision, health, sports, and fitness minus stick-related sports. Yes. We're just we're not going to cover it. Sorry, folks. <laughs> if you turned in just for that niche, we, we're not going to we're not going to get it this time. Maybe next time. I, I Maybe do want bars, pe- not sticks. Yeah, I do want people to know that uh, I have I'm, I'm 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 a head coach of first grade lacrosse. Even though I've never played the cross before, I just think that's hilarious. I love that for you, Jackie. I think when you do sports at the lower than like second grade age or second and lower, it, it really is. Are you able to come up with activities that entertain and keep the children moving and busy? And if so, you are the coach of the year. Yes. A lot of it's just behavioral management. So, so true. At that age. Yeah. I coach multiple sports until about second grade. And then I said, kids, you behave well, but I actually don't know how to play whatever it is we're supposed to be playing. So <laughs> you're on your own. <laughs> so <funny>. my work <laughs> is done. <laughs> uh, so Mallory, since you last been last were on the show, you know we talked way back when about tag. We talked, talked about tag teach and some of your articles there. We talked about sports and dance and some of your studies related to sort of improvement in specifically kind of dance behaviors and health sports behaviors. What's what's new? What's been going on since the last time you you were you joined us? Yes. So I think the last time I was with you guys, I had just started my company, ABA Sports Innovations. I started that mm-hmm. in 2016. And that company is really about offering consultation services in the realm of ABA within health sports and fitness. These days, we're focused a lot more on guiding and supporting BCBAs who are diving into this area. So we provide supervision, trainings, and mentorships. We also now have a learning academy where you can get CEUs from many other awesome practitioners who are in that game with me. And it's a great spot for behavior analysts to learn the ropes of applying ABA to health coaching, personal training, and athletics. We have also have a supervision curriculum that I would love to talk about today. But yeah, since 2017, I've had that company. I also have two brick and mortars now. One is a fitness studio called Kinetic Soul West Chase in Tampa. And then I also have a dance studio called ABA, ABASI Dance Lab, or the kids like to call it a bossy dance lab. <laughs> and um, at a bossy dance lab, we're all about professional, technical, and non coercive dance training through group dance classes. We throw some ABA magic into those group dance classes by focusing on cultivating a growth mindset. We train our instructors like some basic RBT information and behavioral management. And then in addition, we provide one-to-one coaching sessions. So some of those sessions are like the research we talked about in the last episode. So 
working with dancers at not only our studio, but other competition studios on skill acquisition using ABA. We also have some ABA sessions for kids with special needs. My manager is an RBT and has a master's in special education. So we use ABA programming within dance and yoga lessons. And then we also have sessions for preteens and teens, which brings in act therapy with yoga. And we target things like perfectionism and anxiety for performers. But yeah, that's pretty much that's what I'm doing. Cool. Yeah. It's a long lot. Yeah. And we're a research site for graduate students at the University of South Florida. So we have students that come run all kinds of research projects at the studio. We're in the works to become a virtual research spot for another Florida university. So yeah, just been supervising students since 2020 and still trying to keep my foot in the game publishing research and trying to stay as relevant as possible while still running those studios. So yeah. So, so Mallory, you, you're the you're kind of the BCBA supervisor that they always talk about in the literature. And they're like, if only somebody would teach other people how to do this stuff. But it's really hard because you have to be an expert in the area and a BCBA. So you did that part. And now now you get to reap the benefits of having all these you know excellent activities and places for BCBAs who are interested in learning more to go. So congratulations for... for Thank for, you. For, Yo, I get to that paragraph in the article and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. That's too I can't I can't take the can't take the pay cut. I'm I'm too too specialized at this point in my career. But yeah, you, you thought ahead and you got it all under under control. I love it. Yeah, and I'm really proud that some of the this is like just a little little brand for a moment. Some of the other supervisors that are big in the game, like I'm gonna talk about Alex, who owns Objective Outcomes. She was one of my supervisees and business coaching clients, and now she is like killing the game. She's supervising so many people in this area and she's training people that are moving on to supervise other people. So it's just kind of like a little, little like flow chart going now. So we're, trying get, we're trying to get more competent individuals out working in the field who can eventually provide supervision from there. So it's not just like, cause I remember when we talked in 2017, it was literally like me and probably like three to four other people who were yeah, yeah. in the game. And now there's, there's a lot more. So that's great. Yeah. And awesome. Yeah. I, I, I have you thought, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if this is a dissemination station way too early in the show, but are you <laughs> thinking about doing like a home coaching for parents who are like, I'm bad at sports, but I like the idea of structured ways to teach my kid how to do any of these things, except for stick related sport, but like other activities <laughs> or help. Cause I know I, I'm thinking it's about bad. like, I think what after we had, had kind of, you know, first met back then. I know I've tried to use some of those techniques and some of the other articles, you know, we've done on the show kind of smattering over the years. I've tried to use some of that when I'm doing my own like little, you know, little behavior management coaching for, you know, my kindergarten or first grade aged kids when they, when they were that age. And I was like, not great at it because I just really didn't know the scope and sequence and it was a lot of work to do. So I, I feel like that is, you could get parents beating down your door if it's like, do you want to learn some tips for not yelling at your kid about be better at sports? That, that, no, I love that. Yeah. Something I, I put in the notes to touch upon today was just, you know, I have a lot of parents come to the studio who come from studios or training environments that are very coercive. And mm. it's great because I do, I do very little marketing for my studio. And we just have a plethora of people who have either like seen this negative coaching or they've seen effects of their kids experiencing yeah. this negative coaching. Mm. And they're just really looking for a place that like, has the same standard and level of training. So it's not like a recreational kind of place, but it's it's not, you know, working it through those kinds of methods. So I think that gets us pretty, pretty well at kind of the first question uh, that we that we have. And you sort of answered it already, but you know, what about ABA is needed in the sports field? Like, like what you know, ABA, we're good at a lot of stuff. I know sports and health and fitness. I know those, you know, there's behaviors involved there, but come on, like, you know, there, there's so many professionals who've been doing this for a long time. And some of them are mean. Some <laughs> of them use coercive practices, but they can't <laughs> all use it, right? Like, so what is what what are the big gains of having ABA join into the health sports and fitness fields? In your opinion. Yeah. And I know you were saying most of them don't, but really most of them do. If you're in no. any kind yeah. of if you're in any kind of competition training context, most of them unfortunately do. And I really truly feel that coercive training is on its way out. And I can say that, you know, back when we 
recorded the podcast before, there was like research coming out in it. But I really feel like now people are starting to notice, parents are starting to notice coercive coaching like works in the moment, right? You get the behavior that you want, but just, I mean, we already know this, but long term, it has all kinds of negative lifelong effects for the athlete. We've got loss of motivation, anxiety, disordered eating, injuries, and attrition from their sport. And again, I just have so many inquiries from parents of dancers from competition studios who just tell me horror stories about how their dancers are being trained. And a lot of them, unfortunately, keep their students in that environment and bring them to me for therapy. Some switch over completely, but I don't, I don't really push them to switch over completely. If they want to just come for therapy, like that's fine. I'll, I'll make the impact where I can. But that's how I really got deep into act training and supervision in 2020 because that was when I noticed like that was a huge need, a service need for the dancers and musical theater performers, which is my background. They really needed a way to like manage their anxiety and their perfectionism. And unfortunately, they can't change the behavior of those in the context that they're in. So I work with them a lot on learning how to manage those emotions and move forward in a positive way and those kinds of things. And then as far as health coaching, just like the article was talking about, one of the articles today, it just makes us more effective. It makes us be able to be data-based and use behavioral interventions from the literature. And it's something that we can offer clients that other coaches cannot. So but yeah, I really do feel like a lot of this coercive training is on its way out. I'm on some huge like Facebook groups for dance studio owners and teachers. And a lot of people in the last couple of years have been like, hey, has anyone combined like psych with dance? Because there's yeah. like there's so much going on here. And there's you see all these new practitioners who are like going around doing workshops on mindfulness and like psychology principles for these dancers because it's such a like severe problem and it's it's been definitely enhanced since COVID as well. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm going to flip that question though, because I, I, you know, in terms of being, you know, humble behavior analysts, being in a field that is not, you know, sort of seen as one of the behavior analytic fields. I mean, it, it certainly can be, and, and we, and we know, we know how and why, and you've explained some really great benefits. What are some benefits that you found in being a behavior analyst getting into the sports field? I mean, are are there bigger lessons that our field could learn from health and sports and fitness fields? Things personally that you found just extra rewarding from sort of bringing what you know from, you know, the science of behavior to the science of of health and sports? Um, Yeah, that's a great question. I think what sparked in my mind when you asked that question is that when kids are in a sport, so like my kids that dance in my studio, a lot of them are spending upwards of 20 hours a week at the studio. So it might not seem like a sports coach or a dance studio or something like that is going to make that much of an influence as far as like learning things like psychological flexibility and coping skills and self-regulation and social skills. But those kids are spending and most of them are spending an insane amount of time yeah. outside of school in those environments. So I would say that what I find pro- profound for me is that the impact that I get to make on the kids And even though um, a lot of my kids are not that special needs population, I still know, feel and know that I'm making a big impact on those kids. So and teaching them those skills in that context definitely generalizes to other to other domains as well, which is great. Excellent. I think the other thing I, I hear you saying is that there is just such an import to the relationship that's established, Mm -hmm. right? Between Mm -hmm. a coach and a dancer in likely the same way that that same relationship could be established between a therapist and a autistic client. Mm -hmm. And there's a vulnerability there and a protection that Mm -hmm. we need to be providing to those folks in our care, right? And I can see how you have identified those weaknesses and those challenges for that population. And that's how you've ended up incorporating ACT and and those practices, Mm -hmm. which is just fascinating and such a great idea. It is intense out there. I did not do competitive sports. I'm not particularly sporty, but it's everywhere. Every, Every sport, the kids are supposed to have specialized at such a young age. And like you're saying, dedicate this huge number of hours, Mm -hmm. which is, I think, psychologically taxing at a young age for them, even more than physically. Hmm. 
Right. Imagine if you had a coach who was just like, win, 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 win. And then you have a coach who's like, we're going to work hard. What are your values? How are we striving towards those values? How can we accept the outcome and make, you know, committed based actions from that outcome? Like just what a difference that would be over 15 years of conditioning of that. And what that child going into the real world is like who had that kind of coach versus the other kind of coach. Um, Oh my gosh. How they would approach problems, how they would approach, you know, a coach that teaches mindfulness, like all those kinds of things combined. So yeah, I love that. (laughs) Thank you. So we'll we'll get a little deeper into the field and supervision related to the field. But Diana, what articles are we sort of mainly going to be pulling from in addition to all of Mallory's scientific know-how, business acumen for all these <laughs> initiatives. Oh, well, Rob, I thought you'd never ask. So we you had... Made a, you made a... I don't know if everyone could well, see Sometimes you. you've been... Like, we used to write in the beginning and then you, like, try to, like, weave it into the conversation more, but it just makes it so I never know when you're going to do it I or keep if you, you had forgot. Keep you on your toes after no, all these years. Yeah. listening, girl. <laughs> I, I am uh, Okay, so there were... Uh, many articles that we could have picked from because Mallory, you have published extensively on this and bearing related topics in health, sports, and fitness. But one that was uh, highly relevant to the conversation today was the recently published article, Pilot Study of a Manualized Behavioral Coaching Program to Improve Dance Performance by Quinn, Blair, Novotny, and Deshmo. And that was published in Java 2022. And then part of the focus of our conversation for today is going to be related to supervision uh, of trainees and folks who want to enter into new and varied behavior analytic fields. So the other two articles are related to supervision. They include acceptability and feasibility of virtual behavior analysis supervision by Simmons, Ford, Salvatore, and Moretti. And that was published in Behavior Analysis and Practice 2021. And also, Practice and Ethical Considerations for Behavior Analysts in Health, Sport, and Fitness by Holland and Sloviak, published in Behavior Analysis Research and Practice 2021. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to behavior analysts who are either, you know, starting out and they're, they have a, a love of sports and health and fitness and they're thinking that's where they want their specialties to be, or maybe they're thinking of making a, a lane change in terms of what they do. What are the types of jobs that kind of exist if you're a behavior analyst? you're looking to enter this field, like, you know, areas that you want to think about your scope of practice. So I'm sure people get sick of this answer, but it's, it's still the factual answer. So unfortunately I I don't have a better one, but I'm not sick of it, Mallory. That's why I asked the question. (laughs) I want to know. (laughs) I'm saying those, those listening that are trying to get into health, sports and fitness might be sick of this answer, but really entrepreneurship is pretty much the only option right now. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for people. Unless you happen to live, if you live in Tampa, I could give you a job, but some places around the country that are hiring, but still very few. So you really have to think about what your niche is going to be and you have to hone that down and figure out the population that you want to work with. And you have to obtain, obviously, all of your relevant behavior analysis certifications and then all of your relevant certifications in whatever area it is with that population that you want to work with. As far as deciding what kind of population you want to work with, that's where working with a supervisor or a business coach or someone like that would come in. A lot of the initial work that I do with people is really just identifying like what their background is, what they're interested in, and really narrowing that down to a niche. And yeah, I I know another, another thing people ask is like, what? kind of jobs exist for behavior analysts looking to enter this field, you you really have to be your own boss and market yourself. You're responsible for your own marketing as an entrepreneur. Obviously, as mentioned in the article, you need to follow the BACB ethical code. So just because you're not working in autism doesn't mean you can break the ethics code. You have to follow the BACB ethics code. You have to follow the ethics code of whatever Other governing bodies certify you. So for example, I hold a certification through NASM for personal training and Yoga Alliance for my yoga certification. So I have to follow those ethical guidelines as well. But to think about is a lot of times people worry about, well, if I get supervision in health, sports, and fitness, like what kind of job guarantee would I have? And what 
you should be thinking about is what kind of job will you have if you don't? So if you don't get supervision, you don't get that experience, that's what I would think about. If your ideal job is working with people with autism and special needs, then you should be getting supervision in that area. But if that's not the population that you want to work with, then you shouldn't be getting supervision in in other areas. You should be working with a business coach. And, you know, you might be accepting jobs that are beneath your pay level. If you're someone who wants to work with Gen Pop and wants to do, you know, clients who who take far, and I'm just saying that because that was how one way that I started, then you have to work as a bar instructor and you have to be in those studios and you have to be identifying what those clients need and how you can mix the two. And nobody's going to do that work for you, if that makes what's, sense. What's gen pop? Oh, <laughs> like general population, like just oh. like... Oh, you know what I'm like, thinking? It was like a new dance class that I haven't done yet. And I'm like, oh, oh that sounds fun. Yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, that does make but, sense. General population does make sense. Gen pop would be a really fun dance class, though. Mm. Yeah, totally. I want to drink gen pop. It sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah. Gen pop zero for me, though. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, don't need the calories. <laughs> yeah, but there's not really, you know, companies right now hiring for that specific position. You have to make your own specific position. And that comes with all kinds of pros and cons with it. So, yeah. So, Mallory, I kind of have a, a general sort of in terms of supervision, it does feel like as our field enters other fields or starts combining the work we, we know about human behavior into these fields, there's almost like this gradient of supervision right. where if you're in the early days, you're getting more supervision as a behavior analyst who just happens to want to work in a specific field. And at some point, there's like that crossover of right. well, now you can do supervision as a BCBA who okay. happens to already know how to work within this field. So I guess... My first question would be sort of, could you describe kind of what that process was a little bit more for you in terms of how your supervision uh, would have looked when you were sort of one of the few people doing this versus the supervision uh, now that could be given to BCBAs? Absolutely. What the process looks like is, you actually already mentioned this a little bit, which I liked. When people first start with us, we're not throwing them into working with Gen Pop or whoever they're (laughs) working with. It's really, they start, and I've talked to my other colleagues in the area too and kind of confirmed this is how they do it as well. We really start with a lot of like theory, ABA theory and how to apply that within health sports and fitness. As far as their direct contacts, because they do have to have that like once a month direct contact, we usually incorporate them into work with our clients. So maybe they're on a Zoom call for a health coaching client and they take over a little section or same with like a client that I'm working with at my at my studio. And then once they really like develop that theory over a couple months and we've really honed their niche and they've gotten all the relevant certifications outside of the ABA stuff that they need, then they can start taking on clients. So I do always tell people it's a little bit of a it's a process, right? Like you're not just gonna start and be like, oh, I'm I'm gonna have a client next month or or two months from now. Like it, it actually takes time to learn how to bridge those concepts. And then as far as my journey to being a supervisor, I mean, I worked for almost a decade doing research in dance with ABA, working as a dance instructor, working as a fitness instructor, having my own studio and learning these things, still paying a supervisor after I graduated to make sure I was staying true to the ABA concepts while I was applying them in this environment. Many, many years of that before I ended up supervising. And even when I started supervising in 2020, of course, I had like imposter syndrome. And I was like, oh my gosh, can I really do this? But I had a supervisor that was supervising me while I supervised, if that makes sense. And then once I got really confident with that, then I moved on my own. But yeah, the curriculum. So we wrote this curriculum called the Bridging the Gap curriculum. And it basically goes through the entire task list. Not basically, it does go through the entire right. task list. <laughs> and, and, on, the, on the front of it, basically goes through the whole... Sorry, am I like... I yeah. don't realize how much I talk like a teenager because I'm around teenagers all the time until yeah. people point it out to me because I'm not in academia anymore. But anyways... No, you literally take the task list and we go through like every section of the task list and we apply it within examples for health, sports, and fitness. So 
It's all broken down and applied there. All of the readings are related to AB and health sports and fitness because we have a plethora of research in it that's not tapped into. And then we even include readings from other journals as well. And then there's practice activities in there, discussion activities that are all related to health sports and fitness. So it really gives the supervisor something that concrete that they can work with their supervisees and work through. And then obviously like the supervisor has clients, the supervisee ends up having clients. So it's not just like every week you're sitting with the curriculum and going through the curriculum, but it gives the supervisees that unrestricted hours component. That's a little bit hard sometimes to get in a virtual setting. And then it really gives a guideline so that the supervisees are still getting that, you know, top notch experience of going through the task list, even though it's in the health sports and fitness realm, if that makes sense. Okay. I like that. Yeah. yeah. It's good to have things written out. I, I, I do like that two, two of the, I mean, we're not talking like, you know, exactly having read through them or anything, you know, they're not the articles, but just knowing that they're more manualized work. I mean, that, that definitely makes the field feel like it's been progressing a lot in the past few years, just having those documents. Right. And our plan is like our supervisees that we have now, me and the authors of this curriculum, you know, once they start supervising people, we hope to be on as their supervisors when they first start that. And then eventually they can use the curriculum and supervise their own individuals on their own. And it just keeps the, what word am I looking for? It keeps the, like the standard of what they're learning consistent. So I don't know. Standardized? The standard. I don't know. <laughs> so me, I don't know. <laughs> Pyramidal? Thanks. These are the words that are coming to my mind. Okay. Are we pay- playing $10,000? Keep saying right words. Now? No, we're not. Oh, I don't, darn. Well, no. <laughs> I want to know. Even though. <laughs> so, so, okay. So it sounds well, like, so I, I've been getting more into like walking. Like I like walking. We're doing some family walks. We have a little walking app that we all like to use. You know, it does a little post, little gamifying of walking. I'm a BCBA. I have experience coaching pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade soccer. So I think I'm almost ready to start my own walking consulting business. Okay. So I don't think there's any certification about that, but what is the supervision I would need? I'll buy your book and I'll give it to someone who knows more about this and tell them to read it and then pay oh, them to supervise no. me. Or hey, what you, should I do? What, what am I missing here before you, my million you, dollar idea? You got to work one-on-one with a supervisor who has experience with that. So if you were to reach out to me, I mean, I'm pretty sure I could handle a walking case or (laughs) if I wasn't able to, I have people that I could refer you to. So sometimes I get like people that are really interested in health coaching and that's not, that's not an area that I'm in. So I'd refer them to my colleague, Sarah Burby or someone else like that who does health coaching, intuitive eating kind of stuff. But you, you have to get a supervisor. And something I really like want to emphasize in the discussion today is that just because you obtain a relevant certification, it does not equal competence. It does not mean you are okay to go practice with clients. So just because you pass the BCBA exam or you pass your NASM certified personal training cert, I hate to say that, but it doesn't mean you know anything about applying ABA in these contexts. And it's really, really important. <laughs> I spent a lot of money on those certifications, Mel. Are you telling me I can't start my business? I know. Not yet. And it's, you know, nothing, Jon Snow. (laughs) I know. And I hate saying that, but like, I tell people too, like when they talk about, you know, business coaching and they're like, oh, or supervision and they're like, oh, it's an investment and everything. It's like, you truly either pay the money up front or you pay the money in the long run from the Mm -hmm. mistakes that you make and not knowing what to do. Like I didn't have a business coach when I started and I can confidently tell you like I lost hundreds and thousands of dollars making mistakes that if I had a coach or someone that was like, hey, don't do that or do this instead or whatever, I wouldn't have made those mistakes. And it's it's just fact. It is what it is. And, you know, again, like I was saying, I spent about a decade working in lower paying jobs as I was a BCBA, but I was still, you know, working at Pure Bar and working at dance studios and doing internships and all these things. And it's like, you can't get around that stuff as much as you want to. If you want to be a competent practitioner and you want your business to do well, you can't get around it. And I was actually sparked to email you guys after I listened to Dr. Matt Norman's episode about applying ABA in outside areas because I loved what he said so much when he was talking about how if you're applying ABA 
in an outside area, that's a specialization. And in any other field, like a medical field, if you want to specialize, you have to learn everything at the forefront and then you have to spend tons of time, money, energy to specialize in something, right? So why is it in our field, people are just like, oh, well, I grew up dancing and I'm a BCBA and so I can do ABA and dance. It's like, no, you have to do all this additional training and coaching and supervision and there's just no way around that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if I wait a couple of years, it sounds like you and a couple other folks are really getting great at the supervision piece. So, so it may not be as dire as, as it has been in the past. If I wait a little bit longer until you, you iron out some of the kinks of the supervision. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So, okay. So that's, I'm going to copyright that walking idea. If you want to do something with a supervision wise, give me a call first. So I'll get, I'll get right of first supervisee, you yeah. know, I'll, I'll join in. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about your, your article that's kind of in, in our, in our hopper here, looking at the, the point program, because it, it does seem like you having such a history with working with dancers and publishing research on improving dance behavior and dance performance, you also have really thinking not just about supervision of BCBAs, but supervision of clients who themselves have clients. So, you know, in, in terms of, you know, kind of supervising all sorts of people in, mm -hmm. in, in what you do, could you talk a little bit about sort of where the, the, the thought for, you know what, we need to have a different, you know, behavior skills, training-based, coaching, research-based curriculum around dance, where, where that idea came from and sort of some of the steps you took to develop that? The main idea for this was my dissertation study was that I had published this line of research on using behavior analysis to improve dance training, but I was going in the studio as the behavior analyst and pulling kids out of class and running the sessions. So the main idea was like, okay, can we make this manualized for dissemination purposes? Can we train dance teachers to do these things so that, you know, again, it's not hiring a BCBA to come in and do that. I have, I mean, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I don't really think that that's something that's, that's going to be widely disseminated just because I did find through research that the instructors did need a lot of support and a lot of training and a lot more than I was expecting. So I don't know if that like exact model would be replicated. However, something that I have seen pulled from the point program that I have seen with a lot of studio owners. And I was just doing this with a studio owner the other day who hired me to do this is really coming in and taking that task analysis component and giving them data based information on how a student is doing or students are doing on a movement. And then coming back a couple months later and doing that again. That has been a very marketable piece because you always have the issue of dance moms, and I'm sure this is the same in any competitive sport, saying, well, why can't you level up? Or my kid's doing this, you know, why, why aren't they in the higher level? And if you really have that data analysis piece, that assessment, that's the, market, the most marketable piece of it that I've seen so far. But mm -hmm. I think to keep the integrity, it's really going to have to be a model kind of like I have at a, bas a bossy dance lab where like me and my manager are the ones implementing it essentially. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. observe teachers and train teachers and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Not talking about dance moms, I always ask, why haven't I moved up? <laughs> it is helpful. Don't just talk about dance moms. Me too. Like, why haven't I moved up? They're like, you're just not doing it. Yeah. So, is that right? your feedback though, Jackie? It's like, mm, you're really bad and need to do better. No, it's not great like, feedback. No, it's not great. It's not very helpful. It's not really. No. So Where's I the four to one? Where's the specificity? I would love to have that task analysis, <laughs> right? Like in everything I'm doing in my whole life. <laughs> no, seriously, it's yeah. And the one-on-one, -on -one, the private lessons, it's re it's really great for the private lessons. But again, it's something that I just think the BCBA has to do, or or mm. someone like my manager who's an amazing RBT. She's been an RBT for like 15 years and has a master's, and she's learned all the stuff and implements it. You know, like someone like that. But I don't. I truly don't think it's going to be something that's going to spread the world as far as like regular coaches using. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, but but you did, you know, lay it out in the point manual such that that like that was the whole idea, right? Yeah. Is like section one is let me let me tell you, dear reader, about 
reinforcement and prompting and shaping, right? Uh-huh. And then and then in section two, it's talking about, you know, behavior management strategies and practices uh-huh. that someone might not know about if they if they don't have that background that could be applicable to, you know, teaching students or teaching kids. And then section three was was those areas of behavior and now analytic practice, I think, that are quite specifically useful in the sports performance yes. region, right? So video modeling, video feedback, tech, uh, auditory feedback, which we also sometimes call tag teach, yeah. and your pure pieces of that as well, right? So like, I loved how it was all laid out with all of that in mind. Like, like ideally, you. this could be packaged and presented to someone, but it isn't, I mean, it is a I'm significant super hard learning curve. <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. I said I'm super hard on myself too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm like, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't spread. <laughs> well, the, the vision, the vision is definitely there because that that 100 came through in the yes. description of what the manual would be. But it's just a lot to learn, yes. right? Like if folks are not used to thinking, because the way in which we approach behavior is so different than anyone else, right? Like people are not thinking about building skills in the way that we think about them because it's all consequence based, you know, mm-hmm. history reinforcement stuff. And like, that's just not how the general gen pop thinks about not teaching, right? <laughs> so it's, you're, you're tr- attempting to package a lot into yeah. that type yeah. of, of manual. So it's admirable. Thank Don't you. be too hard on yourself. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> not, and something that I thought of while you were talking too is like, I had a, act supervisor who used to say, you know, you just plant the seed. You plant the seed over and over and over again with people and you never know like when it's going to sprout. And so, you know, that could be our way of, you know, you teach an instructor all of these things and it might not seem like, you know, it's it's really making a difference or they might not want to sit there with their computer and graph like we do. But, you know, maybe they're taking something away from that to make their coaching less coercive over time, which... If that helps any kids, that's great. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu, regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. Hey, everybody. Sorry to pause our conversation with Dr. Quinn. But I wanted to remind all of our listeners that ABA Inside Track is Ace and Quaba approved. By listening to this episode, you're able to earn one supervision credit. How exciting. All you need to do is finish listening and then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, or click on the link in the show notes on your podcast player to go directly to the page, enter in some key information, including two secret code word. And these are super special secret code words from our guest, Dr. Mallory Quinn. And the first one is coercive, C-O-E-R-C-I-V-E. Now, that is because certainly one of the topics we've been talking about is how so much coaching right now does use old, outdated, coercive practices. And we are not fans of that. Dr. Quinn's not. None of us here on the show are. And I hope you are not either. But for today, you just need to think of it as that code word, coercive. All right, let's get back to our talk with Dr. Quinn. When looking at the... De- you know, we're developing the point program. It did seem, at least in reading the article, which I, I know is only you know the tip of the iceberg in terms of all the work that went into it and all the knowledge that would need to be had before I think utilizing it. 
was there a thought to some of those kind of practices within there? So like, you know, the video feedback or the various coaching methodologies or the task analysis component that you were wondering, like, I wonder if this, you know, or, or, or we're kind of planning on having generality to say other other sports that maybe wouldn't be ones that were in your scope of practice or training, but some of those general principles sort of being able to be molded for you know, soccer or for lacrosse or for just general, you know, healthy eating or healthy habits, or, or was that sort of not really on your mind when you were trying to put it all together? It wasn't on my mind at the time, but I definitely, I mean, I think that would be a great research idea <laughs> for someone <laughs> um, or someone who in graduate school looking for a research idea. And then also I've had supervisees who have applied a lot of the principles within their own coaching. So although I don't have published data on that, like one of my supervisees was a soccer coach and applied them. Another one was a tennis coach and, you know, she found great effects with it. So we just need someone who is a grad student and has lots of time to <laughs> type up those results and can publish them. That would be All great. Right. Time and, and energy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So and kind of speaking about, you, you know, your supervisees in relation to this, we, we talked more generally about some of the steps, the need for supervision. What more specifically, like when you're thinking about a scope and sequence for one of your supervisees versus say a supervisee who's going to work in, you know, I'm going to work in an autism clinic. So therefore I need a supervisor in that, in that setting. What are some of the topics that you would say you, you need to be thinking about and focusing on in your area of your, your, your field that, you know, the average sort of BCBA who probably is in, you know, in, you know, autism treatment. Probably wouldn't. Like, are there areas that you're like, well, I, we do this a lot more here, mm -hmm. even though I hear from other BCBAs in different fields, they're like, oh, we almost never talk about mm -hmm. X, Y, Z. Like, are there there's areas of focus that you you find yourself really honing in on specific yeah. to your work? Yeah, I would say skill acquisition is the biggest one. We do a lot, a lot of skill acquisition. Not so much. I would, I've never supervised in the autism area, although, you know, I've worked in the autism area a lot. In grad school. But I would imagine that a lot of that is behavioral reduction. I mean, obviously, you're still working on acquisition because you never reduce without acquisition. But I think ours is a lot more acquisition based. We have a lot. I mean, I know when I supervise, I do a lot of act work because a lot of these people from the gen pop come <laughs> with um, very long histories of verbal behavior that affect their, you know, this covert verbal behavior that affects their ability to eat healthy, to exercise, to succeed in their sport. So I would say for me with my supervisees, ACT is a lot bigger of a focus. I, I don't imagine that there's a lot of that with kids with autism because again, it's that whole verbal behavior component. And then again, like verbal behavior procedures, I could generally tell you about them from those like ABLES assessments and things like that. But that's not something I really focus on with my supervisees. I make sure they know enough about that to pass the exam. But that's not an area that we really work in, if that makes sense. I'm and trying to think when you would use an ABLES to help someone with their... We don't. It, with the answer proof, but I don't, I don't think that's going to come into play, right? Yeah. <laughs> but and, but and we, to, to your point... To, be, to your point before, though, you would use other assessments, right? So an assist right. design, a skills assessment, you would use the skills assessment that you've created for that specific field. So it's not like you're not doing it. You're Correct. just not. Yeah, you're just not using what we would typically like. Oh, we're going to do a VB map. That would be weird. Right. Correct. On a ballet um, dancer. Yeah. It's like I just started some Zoom work doing ABA in the area of autism just so I could stay relevant. And I had to like relearn all the like DTT stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I, I don't do any of this like mm -hmm. at my job. And I felt, you know, so dumb because I had to relearn all that stuff. But like, for example, we do private lessons with kids with special needs at the studio and we do assessments and we write a behavior intervention plan for them. But those are also very niche private lessons. So I only accept, it sounds bad saying I only accept, but we only take con clients who have targets that we can appropriately work on in that setting. So for makes example, sense, right? It makes absolute sense that you're not going beyond the scope of your practice. Exactly. So kids that have aggression or verbal behavior who need DTT for verbal behavior, whatever it is, like we don't take those kids. But if it's a kid that has trouble following directions and wants to be in a typical dance or yoga class, we work with those kids. We do a lot of social skills work. 
So I have so many kids that we target social skills within like a yoga session or a dance session. And I'll even take those kids and walk them around the studio and they talk to the parents and they talk to the students and we do like in situ stuff. So like things like social skills, gross motor coordination, um, really basic compliance kind of things like we can work with those kids. But yeah, we don't, just like Jackie said, we try to always stay within the scope. And so certain behaviors we can't work on and, and dance and yoga or whatever it is has to be a reinforcer for that child also, or mm-hmm. it's not going to be an approach. Yeah, it's not like, you know, you have to go to school. You have to learn a lot of school. You do not have to right. do yoga or dance after. Right. And we, you know, don't replace, time. we don't replace a child's ABA therapy. So most of our kids that come for ABA services, they receive like full-time or part-time ABA other places. And they come to us like one day a week where they don't go to their other place just as like an additional extra kind of thing. Like most of mm-hmm. our kids don't even know they're getting therapy, the special needs side. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you ever had clients who, if you're able to talk about it, yeah, clients who come with RBTs or, you know, BC yeah. ABAs and they're supporting their time at your center? Absolutely. So we have that scenario as well. We try to be as inclusive as possible, but there are scenarios because we are like, you know, again, we're not a recreational training facility. Like I try to train my students to be successful in professional settings. So there are advanced classes. And once they start moving up in age, the classes are a little bit harder and more advanced. And there have been scenarios where we have kids that are working with me in therapy while also in class. And then they might have an RBT that's like in class with them. And the other students just think it's a teacher assistant. We just say, oh, Miss So-and-so is here as a as an additional dance assistant because we have assistants in many classes. So yeah, that's a, that's a scenario as well. Sometimes I tell people like, hey, depending on the child's ability, this child can be in this class. However, they would need to have their RBT or someone with them, or you would have to pay someone on our staff to be there and assist them. And we have so many kids that come off the street and have problems in classes. And we very gently plant the seed for them of like, hey, we offer this kind of one-on-one service if you want to come in and try it. And we've had so many parents who, you know, even kids that don't have diagnoses and they start the one-on-one services and they're like, oh, wow, like this has helped so much with, like, I feel like eventually like every kind of studio is going to have a therapist or someone like on staff because it is very helpful. Do you, is there a lot of need for your supervisees to focus on some of their ability to sort of work with other providers or other individuals? Because I would think unlike, say, you know, BCBA is sort of working at like a private company where they probably have one or two clients on the caseload and they're sort of working with a family or maybe, you know, they're the SLP or the OT that's on their team. I I could see that there being so many different individuals that your supervisees would need to be able to work with to collaborate with that, you know, in, in very different mm-hmm. contexts. Yeah. Um, is that something that you find yourself focusing a lot on sort of like how to work with other individuals across, you know, lots of different areas and yeah, levels? I always encourage my supervisees to not just get supervision in the area of health, sports and fitness, because again, like such a big part of our field is outside of that. So I always encourage my supervisees to do both. Very rarely have I heard of people only getting supervision in the area of health, sports, and fitness. I mean, if you know for sure, like that's what you want to do and you have no interest in anything else, like then it makes sense. But yeah, and I also, I also have my supervisees work with me on a lot of these cases like we were talking about. So these, these more strictly ABA cases. So it's a little bit more on the ABA side and less on the health sports and fitness side, just so that they can still get that experience of like how to write a social skills curriculum, how to do parent training, how to write a BIP and all of that. So it's not just like one population and one thing, because I think that is a big part of working in ABA and health sports and fitness too, is you have to like be able to adapt with while staying within your scope, be able to adapt to like different types of clients that might need your services. Mm -hmm. I know one of the articles that that you recommended we look at the Simmons et al. article talking about virtual versus in person supervision. Is that something I, I was a little surprised because I was I would think with health health sports and fitness if you're not in person it's very very hard. Like I'm just trying to think of you know like the, the camera angle we have now just for people to sit around and talk took me like three minutes of futzing around with 
when you're talking about sports, I can't imagine or health or like there's so much movement. There's so much you would need. Is that something that, that, I mean, did you recommend that as something we talk about because it is something you've been able to do or something you see a, a benefit of in the future? I mean, I think that the beauty of virtual is that all these people are getting access to supervision that they wouldn't have access to. So just like the article is saying, is it the best? Is it preferred to in-person supervision? I mean, no, <laughs> I would say <laughs> in-person is always better, but it's giving people access to something that they would never have access to. I've had clients, I had one client who was like in a very rural area of Georgia and had like access to no studios and no nothing. So like we were able to work together virtually. I've had people in different states all over the country that I would have never been connected with. And that's again, where the curriculum comes in and the curriculum gives them all of those unrestricted activities. But then as a BCBA in this area, as a supervisee, you have to have clients as well that they can work with because until that person has the toolbox and the access to pick up more clients, they have to work with yours to get that mm -hmm. direct hour at least or direct. Mine's always mm -hmm. an hour because my don't do that many hours, but you know what I mean? Get that direct mm -hmm. one to every month. You have to have people for that. But I would say some benefits are that our supervisees can record sessions and we can watch them together and give live feedback, which is something that you can't really do in person. So like one of my supervisees, again, the tennis coach, she would record her coaching sessions or her, she would record some PE classes that she was teaching or she implemented like different ABA strategies in. And so that was something as we could stop and watch, you can do error correction. And then obviously the cons, just like the article mentioned, it doesn't capture everything. So there could be things that are going on that maybe the client's doing or that the behavior analyst is doing that aren't appropriate that you can't capture and give feedback. So there's pros and cons for sure. But I would say the biggest thing is that it's giving people access to something that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah, I, I know in the Simmons article, it was it was a COVID it was a COVID article. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it had that that tenor of like, most of the people here didn't know you could do this online. And now they realize, I guess I have to do this online. <laughs> and then in, in the years since then, you have more and more people who the idea of, I'm guessing the idea of virtual supervision is like, that's just what I've done for the past five years of my life or four years of my life. So why would right. this be any different? I mean, have your results been similar in terms of everyone would rather be hanging out with you doing supervision, but they tolerate doing it online and they don't think it's that, you know, they, they think it's a, it's equivalent or are you finding more people who are like, this is the only world of supervision I know anymore is everything online? I mean, I don't think it's equivalent, but I'm sure, I guess there's some people out there that would, I mean, I have ADHD. So me sitting on Zoom is just hard in general, but I'm sure, I guess there's some people out there that would that prefer it. But yeah, the art, I mean, the article definitely said, you know, mo everyone usually prefers in person, which I don't, I don't think that's surprising. But I like how they also talked about those other benefits are like for the BCBA, they're not over as overwhelmed because they're not driving everywhere. They can prep more for the session. Again, if you have a curriculum or something manualized, you just have that hold up and you can go through that. So, because that's happened to me before where they're like, oh, I don't have anything to talk about. And it's like, Okay. It's like, or this, this client canceled or this nothing happened during this session. And you're like, all right. So at least if you have the next one, you can pull that out and you can be like, all right, well, where were we in the, in the, in the chat split? That's right. You know, go through there. You thought we weren't having this session? Oh, it's, no. I know. That's just, that's so nice to have. Like, I, yeah, there's oh. nothing worse than the like, did you get the video? You know, because I, I certainly, the, the article, I'm mean, Simmons at all. They still, the, 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 virtual sort of referred to the things like video feedback, which I, I've been a huge fan. Like the second I realized, oh, you can film a session and then we can watch it and I can give you feedback. Oh, cool. It's so much easier time-wise and so much more specific than I'm coming to see something. Oh no, the kid's sick today. Okay, well, do you have anything else you want to show me? Right. I don't have anything I want to see. So, blah. Hey, I just, stack uh, time. Yeah. It's you are, always you stack it's time. It's always stack time. It's always recess. It's <laughs> always rainy it's day. Always, no one's in the school. It's always time when they're going to be in yeah, the bathroom for like 45 minutes, right? You come right when the kid's going to take a poop. Yeah. That happens yeah. to me. I didn't, I didn't realize that until, like I said, I just picked up this job in autism and it's, it is on Zoom. So it's not that big of a deal. But I didn't realize they're like, oh, yeah, if the person's not on time or whatever, like you can't bill, like that's Medicaid fraud. I was like, what? 
<laughs> like, yeah, I've never, I've never like, wow. I've worked in this area in like 10 years. So I was like, you know, in my studio, if someone doesn't show up, like they have a contract, like they get charged either way. So mm-hmm. they're, pro- they're all private pay. So yeah. I, was yeah. like, right. I was like, what? Like, that's crazy to me. I mean, it makes sense, but yeah, I guess if yeah. they're napping or like eating, uh, yeah. No, so, there's always something, world, yeah. always something more fun than the supervision activity you had planned you know, <laughs> when you when you show up. You're like, oh, it's someone's birthday. We're going to go do cupcakes. Like, I mean, there's nothing on the task list about cupcake eating. So I don't I mean, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to make this one work. Sorry. You know, but I, I love that that the video feedback piece. I just think that's been invaluable in terms of in terms of the virtual supervision. So. Hopefully, sure. I mean, your, your supervisees have been, have been able to, to do that. It sounds like the te- like tennis and some of the other sports they've been able to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I think they've all been happy and doing well. I mean, again, that's coming from me. So it could be biased. <laughs> They're, they all seem to be doing very well. I had one girl who she got her job to literally pay a full time salary position for her ABA stuff because it was. They saw the value in it that much. Wow. 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 That's, great. that's the dream right there. Yeah. yeah. Because that's okay. always where these conversations end up, right? When yeah. we're talking about like outside of the box applications of ABA, it's, it's, it's usually quite clear how the principles apply. And it's clear to us as behavior analysts how one could create a job that is, you know, highly socially relevant in that area. But the question always comes down to who's going to pay right. for this? How can I actually have a career? Right. In this area that I'm passionate about, but isn't well established the way that, you know, ASD or developmental disability work is. So that's like so exciting to hear that, that, yeah. that yeah. they saw the benefit and they said, yes, we want to invest in this. Yeah, people definitely pay. I've been full time in my business since 2018 and I have my brick and mortars and everything. So we have, yeah. we have lo- loads of expenses with that. Yeah, people definitely sure. pay. I'd say the biggest thing is just, you know, getting your competency up and doing good work and word of mouth. And that's, that's just where it's at. No. Mallory, another thing I wanted to talk a little bit more about in terms of the supervision in, and this came up a lot. It was in the whole second half of, of Holland and Sloviak's article was ethics in this new okay. field. Cause I know anytime I think about ethics, I think about it very specifically to the, you know, what I've been doing for my whole career and how I can use the ethics code to, you know, do my best work and be ethical and all my actions. Uh, but then whenever we do an episode or we're learning about a new field that uh, the ABA is entering or adding, you know, and adding to ethics just seems like it's, it's, it's almost like a whole new ball game in terms of how many little ethical snafus you can you can run into so what what is the supervision for ethical behavior when it comes to to health sports and fitness it were I mean, it could be exactly the same but yeah. i would assume there's there's a lot of differences I mean, because all the slow certainly bring up a lot of the ones we talked about like scope of competence being within your competence being within your population yeah. uh but just, then they spend a lot of time talking about things like marketing and like, how do you know that you're, you know, which certification are you working under? I mean, is that something you and your supervisees spend a lot of time on or that you made sure to add in when you, you were doing your supervision curriculum? Yeah. So we go through the, all the ethics stuff in the task list and it does come up a lot. And you would think that, you know, ethics is something that's a lot more in autism than this, but it, it does come up a lot in this as well. I can give you guys like a couple like little examples, but. You know, in regards to marketing, you do still have to follow the BACB guidelines. I would say with things like dance and fitness, there are going to be a lot more people that are public about doing things. I liked how she said the tagging thing because that happens to me a lot. Like people will tag like, oh my gosh, this studio and this place has been so amazing for me and blah, blah, blah. And like if they posted it and they tagged me, I'm not going to be like, hey, you have to take that down. (laughs) Like I can't post that with their identifying stuff unless they've given explicit permission or they're not a client anymore and they've given explicit permission, like all that kind of stuff. So sometimes when I post testimonials, I'll just say like a little disclaimer. I'll say like from a former client, recruited, post services, or else if I post photos of a client in a session because the parents like me to post photos of clients during session, I'll always just say like post it with permission. I have them sign stuff. The other thing that gets tricky is like, especially in my studio, we're all about inclusion. So when I don't post those kids because 
you know, I'm just told I can't post those kids, people actually get offended and they they say stuff about it. And they're like, hey, why isn't my kid posted? So what I've always done is I always just put posted with permission or shared with permission or tagged by the parent or something like that. And then in regards to other things with marketing, I think something really important is that we see a lot of people who say like, I'm a BCBA and a health coach or something like that with the intention to get more clients, but they're not actually using behavior analysis in their practices. So Mm. I think that's a really big thing that needs to be called out is like, if you are a BCBA and a health coach and you're promoting yourself as such, then you need to make sure that you're getting adequate supervision, you're writing VIPs, you're collecting data, whatever it is. And there are times where those scopes can cross. So I'll I'll give two examples of that in my practice because this has come up with my supervisees. So one thing is for private lessons. A lot of times I have dancers who want private lessons just for choreography or to work on conditioning or they're from another studio and they want me to clean their solos or something like that. And then I also have the ABA private lessons where I do like the tag teacher, the video modeling, video feedback, or like you're talking about with the special needs kids, we have the BIPs and everything like that. So what I do is I very clearly outline those two services. And when a parent signs up, I very clearly say, this is this is service one, this is service two, this is what this service includes, this is what this one doesn't include. So if they are doing the ABA-based private lesson, they know I'm collecting video, I'm collecting data, I'm giving you graphs, I'm writing a bit everything's research-based. And if you choose this other one, there is none of that. So that helps okay. like staying in the in the lane of competence because there are going to be times where things like that cross. And another example I was thinking of reading this article is I've had a lot of students who know that I'm a therapist. And just like you were talking about, Diana, like they trust me, they want to talk to me about stuff. And their parents will sign them up for a dance private lesson. This has happened so many times across all ages. And they'll be like, Miss Mallory, I just want to do therapy. I just want to talk. I just want to do this. I just want to do that. And I have to say to them, this is not what your parent signed you up for. If you would like me to, I can call your parent and express that you have asked for this and see if that's something that they want to do. And, And I've had those situations before where I call the parent and I say, hey, your child is saying this, they want to do therapy. They want, you know, do you want to do two privates a week and one is a dance private and one is therapy? Or do you, you know, like we just, all of that has to be clearly delineated, signed off on all of those kinds of things. So there are different kind of ethical issues that show up for sure. And there's definitely plenty to talk about. I've also had a scenario recently where a mom was bringing her kids for therapy a divorce mom, and then was telling the dad that it was a yoga lesson. And yeah, so that was a tricky situation for me. And I had to tell her, once I found out about that, I said, I have to stop services unless, you know, your ex-husband signs off and agrees that this is what he wants, because that's not, we're not presenting one thing and doing another, right? Sure. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so situation, and and I know that happened to one of my supervisees up in Pennsylvania. The same thing happened to her. Ex-husband found out she was using ABA within a private lesson. He was like, oh, I thought this was just tennis coaching. And she's like, I got everything signed off on. I did all the forms with the parent, whatever. But we're not responsible if the parent doesn't tell another ex. But once, Mm -hmm. once we find out we're responsible. Yeah. So... That, you know, and there was a whole drama there. Like she was like, I can't believe you're cutting services. And I was like, I just, I, I can't do that unless he agrees. Or yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. if you want yoga, I'll do yoga. But that's, that's a different service. Yeah. So yeah, so definitely like thinking about all those things. I would say like those were some things that could have been added to the article. But I think like the marketing component is a big one. And just representing yourself and in, in what you're doing and all of your services appropriately. Ooh, that sounds like a lot to juggle. Yeah. I know just hearing you talk about all the different services that you provide, it feels like you almost want to have like, you know, four or five different buildings where it's like, which, oh no, that that's not any, you gotta, you're gotta go out <laughs> gonna go across doors. the street. Yeah. yeah. I got the sign of what you're going to get. That's over there. <laughs> We're, you're in the wrong space right now. Just to make it really clear. <laughs> you have to be really, really clear. Really clear. Yeah. So that, you know, that doesn't fall outside, I think, of the code, but it certainly is a different 
way in which you might need to be interpreting some mm-hmm. portions of the code. Because those things aren't in that just in the right. family book. Yeah. Right. No. Yes. No, it's just, you know, it's same, same ethics, but different scenarios. Yeah. The yeah. context doesn't always yeah. sound like it's like a one-to-one correspondence as well. So there's oh, a little yeah. bit of creative thinking of how they, how no, you must so, follow the code in that setting. But that's why it's good to have a supervisor because you can talk to your supervisor about those things. You can talk to your colleagues about it. We've been doing a lot of like CEUs and the Learning Academy on ethics to, you know, share our experiences and help people navigate that because, yeah, like I said, it happened to my supervisee, that one situation, and then it happened to me. And I was like, oh, this is something that we should definitely oh. have a CEU about. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, it's <laughs> happening a little frequently. So, you know, just things like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Smart. Well, I think it's about time for us to start heading into the dissemination station. <laughs> so I was so enthusiastic. I wanted Jackie, to keep going. You're just you're just waiting. Just you're keep waiting going. to to get to do the sound. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because I was laughing. So if you don't ever look at our our social media accounts, Diana did a most amazing social media plug. On Friday, where it's the Ben Affleck, where he looks like totally exhausted so and annoyed. He, he didn't get his Dunkins that day. Yeah, that's the it's usually the Duncan commercial, but you put like how I feel when you guys keep talking during dissemination station. Yeah. So yeah, so the thing is that like you're trying to like wrap it present up. these thoughts, and we're where he bringing up movie quotes, <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, come on, back on track. So Marilyn, so what, true, what is the best movie about dance? I mean, now that Jackie brought it up, I well, wants to talk about it. Um, I don't know if you guys that, that, like Save the Last Dance, but the memes kill me. Like all the recent memes of... So do you, do you guys know that movie? Is I that, actually do. So who is I that? Know. See, this is... I I know, Julia Smiles? Smiles? Yes. It's Julia right? Smiles. So yeah, she's, I she's love a, that movie. Yeah, she's a ballerina and she ends up at this like inner city school... And she like learns hip hop and she wants to go to Juilliard, but like her mom died. So she's depressed. So this guy, she starts dating, like teaches her hip hop and she does this like ballet hip hop fusion audition for Juilliard, but it's just absolutely terrible. Like it's. Oh, but, I thought it was good. You know, I'm Jack- not a dancer. No, well, right? You need a supervisor in dance movie watching. Yeah. Apparently. Back in the day, we all thought she like, Eight. So that's the teen slang, by, by the way. Now the kids say she ate or left no crumbs. We like back in the day, we thought she ate. Said no, like thought it was so good. And now everybody looks and they're like, wait, I don't, I still don't understand. What is, what is wait, eight? Yeah, what is that, that a good thing? thing? No, like she's Why amazing. Eight? I feel like she ate shit. She, like, like she did no, a terrible like she job. Did. Like she wait, fell. Yeah. Like eight. So when you like, if I post a video like on our business page of like a really good dance, like the teens will be like, ah, oh, she ate or she left no crumbs. Okay, so that's a good thing. Oh, okay. Yes. Got it. Yes. But yeah, it's amazing. Like at the time, at the time, everyone thought the dance was really good. But then now we all look back and we're like, this dance was horrible. And Julia Stiles oh. was not trained to do that. Is she not a trained dancer? No. No, I don't think so. Okay. But the, just the memes nowadays about the movie are so funny because they're like, that would never get you into Juilliard. But okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, the um, the movie meant- that. I would like to bring up is the cutting edge. Does anyone remember Ooh, that movie? Moira Kelly and Deaton yes. Sweet? Yes. A movie I never saw, but I, I saw the poster. It's you, not a dance, it's ice but skating. But cutting edge wasn't dance. It was ice skating I because know. I used to be a figure skater. Oh, I know, but it's all related to health sports. It health is. Sports, it's, right? It's, health yeah, sports? I need to watch this movie. Who's in it? Oh, it's from 1992. Moira, Moira, Moira Kelly, Kelly and D.B. Sweeney. Sweeney. And so you guys are talking my little, you're talking my language now. Usually the movies that you were like, well, have you seen this? I'm like, no. But by the way, I am two for two. That's pretty awesome. Right right now. I also want listeners to know I pulled those two names out of the blue. I am not looking on IMDb for those. I just knew them. So yeah. why I don't own my own chain of businesses like Mallory because I'm spending too much time remembering movie posters from right. the 90s. I don't even know what happens in the cutting edge except that she's training did beat ice skater and DB Sweeney is really cute. And he's so a hockey he just player. Said, Toe pick. He's I've heard he's a hockey he's player. He's a hockey player. Yes. Oh yeah. She has to teach. Oh yeah. Okay. It's all coming back to me. Needed, Wait, why don't you post a, a picture? Now you got to post yeah. a picture about how 
uh, Jackie's frustrated with Diana because she won't let us actually even get to the Seven Station questions. Well, it's really Jackie's fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch the movie, Diana. I'm writing it down. Okay, good. Let me know if you like it. I'm sure it's amazing. What about Blades of Glory with John Heater and Will Ferrell? <laughs> Oh, wow. Yes. Well, that's a good no. one. That one. Come on. No. Okay. Look so on track. Okay. okay. That's enough. All right. So before we get into the super... I don't know that one, so we'll get back just... on track. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I see how it is. All right. Me too, for you. <laughs> so, Mallory, when you think about sort of what's next for the health, sports, and fitness, you know, behavior analysis, collab kind of field in the future, just in general, not necessarily related to supervision, kind of What's what's next for sort of growing the field so that there can be more supervision in, you know, kind of in your in your opinion, as someone who's been in, in the field for so long now? The curriculum, but really, we just need people who are practicing competently and who are trained by people who are practicing competently and using standardized materials and making sure to stay true to the science. And I think that we have no lack of research in ABA and health sports and fitness, and there's much continuing. It's just a matter of getting it out there, having more competent practitioners and more entrepreneurs. So if you had advice for someone who's listening and, you know, maybe they're still in grad school or they've only just left grad school, but they're really looking to get into health sports and fitness as a specialty, what would you recommend they look for in their supervision and their, in their supervisory work? They could call you and email you, I'm sure. We'll, and we'll get all that information what? too. When? But like, are there things that they need or, or that you find that some folks are getting better at with supervision and others maybe are doing as much and, and could improve in some areas? I would say look for people who are doing things and not just people who are talking about doing things. It is. Because there's a difference yeah. between practitioners who are out there doing this stuff and have been doing this stuff and practitioners who have a very, very nice social media, but mm -hmm. you don't actually know what ABA they're doing, if that makes sense. Yes. Gotcha. They got to they gotta specify exactly how they're using yeah. the science and then show you it, not just Yes. And it. I would say, you know, you get what you paid for as well. So don't, if you, if you have the means, don't be afraid to invest in a supervisor that's going to give you great supervision because that's going to set you up for the rest of your life. And it is a business expense, by the way, <laughs> if you set up your right. business. Yeah. So it's something that, you know, you can expense for yourself and invest in yourself. Other than that, start taking, if you're not, so I tell people who aren't sure if they want to start with supervision, start taking CEU courses. So as I mentioned, we have the Learning Academy. There's other, like Julie Slowiak has courses, Team ABA has courses, like go take some CEU courses and see if it's something that you're even, you know, interested in before you start interviewing supervisors or investing in a supervisor. That's something that you could do and start working in whatever the area is that you're interested in. Even again, if it's less pay or you know, if it's an internship, if you want to do personal training, go get your NASM CPT, go start interning at a gym or learning from people. Those are other great ways to start. Excellent. And if there are folks who are already sort of on, on the path of working in health, sports and fitness, and they're hoping to expand the field and be supervisors themselves, do you have any advice for sort of the people who are going to be supervisors or are thinking about doing supervision in this, in this field specifically, things that they should be doing? Yeah. Well, again, that's, that's why we wrote the curriculum to hope. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I cured you up for them. <laughs> to give them. Well, it gives them a tool, right? To start. So they know they're going through the ta they're going through the entire task list. They have all the articles, they have all the activities. And then again, like I was saying, it's important that you have a supervisor supervising your supervision initially. So I think the BACB actually requires that if you're less than a year. Yeah. A year. Okay. Yeah. No, but even after that, like I, when I started supervising in 2020, I had been a, I had been a BCBA for many years, but I still had a supervisor because I was, well, one, I was delving into new things like apps that I hadn't done research in, but 
I had a, another supervisor that was supervising my supervision just to make sure that everything was like competent and all that good stuff. And yeah. Excellent. Well, Dr. Mallory Quinn, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It was so great to catch up. Thank you, guys. And hear about this again. So everyone has it kind of in one in one chunk. What, what So we, we talked about a lot of resources. So could you share kind of what those are, some contact information, places people can find you? We'll put some links in the in the notes as well for folks, but just, just sure. so they kind of hear it before they yeah, sign so off. Yeah, so our Learning Academy, which has the courses and the curriculum and everything on there is learn.abasportsinnovations.com. And then if you are interested in supervision, my website is abasportsinnovations.com. And if you are interested in an area that I am not as competent in, such as health coaching or nutrition, I have colleagues, great colleagues that I could refer you to. If you'd like to check out our dance studio and just kind of see how we're implementing ABA in real time, our Instagram is A-B-A-S-I Dance Lab. So you can check us out there and you can see some super cute kids dancing. And uh, yeah, if, if anyone wants to work together or has questions, they can always reach out to me. My email is Mallory, M-A-L-L-O-R-Y, Quinn, Q-E-U-I-N-N, at ABA Sports Innovations. Make sure there's an S at the end of innovations.com. Well... We want to thank Dr. Quinn so much for coming on the show today and talking about health, sports, and fitness and supervision. But before we wrap up, we want to do the last section of our show, which is pairings. Pairings. What's pairings, Diana? Oh, yes. Well, pairings is a section of the show where I tell you about past episodes that you might want to go back and listen to in our back catalog if you hadn't listened to them before because they relate to the topic that we are discussing today. So let me tell you what those are. I have quite a few. You could go back and check out episode five in which we discuss tag teach. That's actually the first time that we contacted Mallory's work mm -hmm. because we reviewed an article and then she reached out to us and said, hey, that was my one. <laughs> oh my goodness, great. So then following that, we had her come on the show in episode 41 and talk about sports performance. So you... If you listen a long time, you have heard Mallory speak to us before. You could also check out episode 46, where we talked to Dr. Nick Green about behavioral fitness. He also rejoined us in episode 151 to talk about fitness activity and fake resolutions. You could check out episodes 90 and 91, which are a two-parter in which we discuss the Murray Sidman absolutely excellent book, Coercion and Its Fallout. Mm -hmm. You could listen to episode 199, where we talked to Dr. Jolie, Julie Sloviak about self-care and modern-day burnout. And finally, the episode that Mallory referenced, episode 211, we talk about variety in ABA with Dr. Matt Norman. So lots and lots to pick from. Those are all good there. episodes. Yeah. I, I don't want to I don't want to say that like other pairings. I don't like those old episodes, <laughs> but those are all ones I distinctly remember the conversation. I think it was because they were topics that were outside of my own scope of, yes. of competence yes. by, by quite a lot. So it was a lot to learn. It's very, very interesting. Yes, absolutely. Good stuff. Not you to, shoot, go not back to shoot our own horn about how okay. awesome those episodes are. And then I also like to recommend a snack to go with the episode too. So I wanted to pick one that would be a, a good snack for maybe after you've done a dance class. So I chose peanut butter energy balls. Those things are great. Mm -hmm. You can make them lots of different ways. I like them with peanut butter, oats, some honey. You could throw in some coconut, like shredded coconut in there, maybe some mini chocolate chips. Roll those puppies up, put them in the fridge. They're delicious. Uh, oh, flaxseed for sure. Mm -hmm. Don't forget the mm -hmm. flaxseed. And then to go with that, a drink that we came up on the show, a gin pop. Oh, yes. <laughs> it took me a minute there. I was like, we, we made a bush What's drink. What's a gin pop? Yeah, we made up a gin pop. If you listen to the episode, hopefully you'll know what we're talking about. But I guess it'll be kind of like a gin fizz, which is basically gin, something like a Sprite or a 7-Up and like a lemon. What about like a, a orange Fanta and gin? That How terrible is that a be? totally your own creation. I don't know what that's going to taste like. I also do not think that you should drink this after you go to dance class. So Probably that, that not. was only it's for the energy balls. It's not going to hydrate very well. No, the gin pop is a different thing. That's just for funsies. Please enjoy. All right. Thanks, Diana. 
And thank you all so much for listening to ABA Inside Track. We really appreciate it. If you have a moment, why not leave us a review uh, wherever you get your podcast? We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any of those places. Subscribe if you have not. You can also find us on all the socials as ABA Inside Track. And you can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com to find links to all of the episodes we discussed in pairings, all of the episodes we've ever done, as well as links to all of the research articles that we discussed, as well as links to our special guests' information that she was so gracious to share. If you want even more ABA Inside Track, you can also subscribe to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where for $5 a month, you're able to get access to all of our episodes a week ahead of time, as well as access to our quarterly listener choice episodes. And if you want a little bit more, you can even get our quarterly book club episodes for going to our $10 premium tier. You get to vote on all of those topics and all of those come with TEs for listening and for subscribing on that page for no additional cost. That's just for being our subscriber there. Again, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Trend, where actually when this episode comes out, we'll have a new book club about ready to come out. What is the book? We don't know because that hasn't uh, it's been voted on yet, but you could listen to some of our previous ones, including our recent one, speaking of a topic that, that we just uh, talked a little about, Act for Behavior Analysts. We just did that book club for our winter book club. Again, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. Some final thanks. Of course, big thanks to Dr. Mallory Quinn for being on the show. Thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Carl Sture for interstitial music, and Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his amazing editing work. Oh, and you probably want that last secret code word. It is vegetables. V-E-G-E-T-A-B-L-E-S. You know, vegetables, like the delicious food that you should eat a lot of for your health. Eat those veggies. Eat your veggies. Eat your veggies, folks. All right. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye.